Okay, great. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Please let me know in the chat that you are able to see it. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, this is going to be a few hours. We should hopefully get you out before or at noon, no later than that. Um, what we're going to do is do some introductions um, and then the o &M general overview. We're going to go really heavily into the stormwater control measures, particularly um, th that are related to the 2023 grant funding round projects. We're also going to go through the gr grant reporting tool, which is online on our green infrastructure website. We'll also be going through the annual inspection, um, which um, it's a requirement that we have all the projects um, do an annual inspection. Um, also, the district does an annual inspection as well. And then um, last but not least, the educational signage, uh, um, which is a co-benefit to your project. Um, so with that said, my name is Jessica Cotton. I'm the grant programs administrator here at the district, which I oversee several grant programs, including this green infrastructure grant program. I'm pretty sure I met most of you all. Um, and I also have my colleague here, Chris Hartman, who is the stormwater technical specialist. <clears throat> So let's get started. The Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District supports the strategic implementation and long-term maintenance of green infrastructure that protects, preserves, enhances, and restores natural hydraulic functions. Uh, here at the district, um, as a grant um, project that is being funded um, through our GIG agreement, all grantees, must attend the o &M workshop or have a representative to attend um, just to ensure that the green infrastructure practices will continue functioning property. And basically, it's all about the maintenance um, do, throughout the duration of the life of the stormwater control measure practice. So here you'll see a spreadsheet um, about our total funding and awarded projects throughout uh, the, our lifespan of the project program starting in 2014. Um, as you can see, 2023, we are awarding a little over $2 million, and then the runoff reduction is over four, $4 million runoff reduction um, gallons per year. Um, with that said, we're just going to hop right into the operation and maintenance general overview where Chris Hartman will be taking over. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, good morning, everybody. Chris Hartman, stormwater technical specialist here at the district. I believe I know most of you or if we don't know each other, we will get to know each other well over the next several years. Um, <clears throat> One uh, housekeeping item, uh, if any questions come up uh, throughout the uh, presentation that we provide today, uh, certainly put them in the chat and we will uh, refer back to the chat on occasion to answer any of those uh, as we skip from subject to subject. So um, <clears throat> be aware that uh, I cannot see your faces right now. <laughs> I'm looking at the presentation only, uh, so uh, Jessica will, will be monitoring the chat and the uh, presentation itself. OK, uh, so. Buckle up because there's a lot to cover, uh, and I know some of you are uh, repeat customers. Uh, you've probably seen this more than once or at least once. Um, we did change a few things up, so uh, but no, nothing significant from what you've seen in past years. Uh, but I do know that a lot of folks, uh, this may be the first time uh, that they've seen this presentation. So 
Um, <clears throat> the way it's going to work uh, is we're going to be breaking down operation and maintenance into three major subcategories. Uh, we're going to be talking about the design phase considerations. We'll then jump into the construction phase considerations, and then we'll talk about the actual um, maintenance phase uh, of a completed project and things that need to be considered for long term operation and function. The uh, a little more detail is at first of those three phases, design, construction, maintenance. We're going to just kind of go over the general information that applies to all uh, stormwater control measures. Uh, and then when we complete that, we'll dive into uh, the specifics of the particular projects or types of stormwater control measures that we are funding for this uh, 2023 cycle. OK, so uh, we'll start with the design considerations, the general overview. Uh, the general overview for design, um, simply put, begin with the end in mind. All right. Uh, this is the most important step we feel uh, is to make sure that you set your project up for success during the construction and long term maintenance phases. And so how do you do that? The uh, first thing to do, of course, with any stormwater control measure in the design phase is to use an accepted standard. Uh, this is for you design engineers out there, of course, and uh, I know that you know this, uh, but uh, the standard is the Rainwater and Land Development Manual that the state of Ohio uh, maintains, and uh, it is uh, overseen by the Ohio EPA. <clears throat> the next thing to uh, consider after you Boy. know your design standards is to ensure that your practice uh, has accessibility when it is constructed. So your design phase needs to give that um, uh, consideration. Uh, will people be able to get to it to maintain it properly? Because on the left side there, uh, obviously there's very easy access to that bioretention cell that's in the middle of the street. Uh, it may require some lane closures to do some maintenance, but so be it, uh, easily seen, easily accessed. Uh, the green roof, on the other hand, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, not so easily accessed, you know, um, you need a lift or forklift or something to get to it. Uh, the point of this being uh, that the harder it is to access and see the practice, the less likely it will be maintained properly, out of sight, out of mind kind of approach. Uh, so uh, obviously with green roofs, that's the extreme end of the spectrum. Uh, they're always going to be way up in the air like that. Um, but uh, there are simpler ways to provide access on that on any type of stormwater control measure. Your schedule on your design plans uh, needs to take into account the timing of implementation of the actual practices. And simply put, and you're going to hear this several times as I talk, uh, simply put, uh, you shouldn't be installing the practices before the drainage area to them is stabilized. Uh, excessive sediment in stormwater runoff to green infrastructure practices uh, can cause severe damage to them. And the last thing you wanna do is cause that damage during the actual construction phase. So having a schedule that lays that out on your plan is important. And this is just a standard note that we see on a lot of bioretention uh, designs. The design phase is also the time to give consideration to, well, how can I make the inspection, the future inspection of my practice easier? Um, and there's a, different ways to do that. Um, one of the most common for any type of infiltration practice is to put some type of observation well uh, within the practice itself. Uh, this would allow you uh, to take the cap off the pipe and to identify uh, where the water level is in the underlying layers. Is the practice draining or isn't it uh, as intended? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, there are other things that can be done. Uh, those are the types of things you'll want to talk to your design engineer about, uh, but uh, this is just one example of how that can be done. Take into consideration flood routing. Uh, if a worst case scenario happens and your practice does fail, where will that water go? Um, 
a lot of times, or I should say almost every time, a, a good designed stormwater control measure, whether it be green infrastructure or not, will have emergency overflow capabilities to it. Um, but to make sure uh, for your unique design that that is taken into consideration because we don't want this type of situation. Again, an extreme situation to drive home, point the point home, uh, but the, if the water is not going where it's supposed to be going, uh, we, we can cause damage to property uh, on your on your property or even offsite areas. <clears throat> Many uh, green infrastructure practices require specialized materials. Um, ensure that the specifications for those materials are clearly laid out on your design plans or in your specification uh, manual. The uh, most critical one that we often refer to is when you're using some type of planting soil, uh, specifically green roofs, bioretention, that type of thing. Uh, there's a very specific soil mix that's needed to make those things work right. Um, and you can see that there's differences between soils as the image uh, is intended to demonstrate. But, but those soils are supposed to be about 80% sand, so they drain readily. You don't need much organic matter in those to support plant life. Uh, but you do, do need a lot of sand and gravelly type mix in it to get it to drain properly and very little clay, which tends to hold the soil. Uh, and so if you don't use what's required, uh, you're setting yourself up for failure and, and future expenses. So make sure that the design plan addresses that. Ensure uh, if there's specific notes and details on for your practice, uh, that those are clearly laid out on your design plans. And of course, uh, when your design engineers uh, submit these for us or to us for review, uh, this is the kind of thing we take a real close look at, obviously. Um, but uh, there are uh, this particular permeable paver uh, detail from one of our future or one of our past projects um, <clears throat> shows you how uh, the simple note on the bottom right of the screen that's circled in red is important. Um, you know, does the contract will the contractor know? Uh, to scratch up, if you will, or scarify uh, the bottom layer of the excavation before all the stone layers are placed on top of it. Uh, this is just a simple uh, note that's included because <clears throat> uh, we want to maximize uh, the potential for infiltration. Um, and then again, just another example of a specific site specific detail that's unique to a project that we funded. Uh, and how the water is conveyed from left to right through the permeable pavers to an four inch under drain to an underground infiltration system as well that actually has a bioretention system on top of it. So there's a lot going on right here uh, and it's important to know those elevations and those dimensions so the contractor knows exactly how to install that. At the design phase, there may be a need to do infiltration testing. Uh, this is sometimes needed and sometimes it's not. I won't get into the details at the moment of, uh, of when that is, uh, but just note um, if there is a need for infiltration testing uh, during the design phase, uh, you should do so in a manner um, where the placement of that infiltration test is in approximately the location of where your practice will be and approximately at the depth of the excavation of that practice to get you the best possible information uh, that you would need to finish the uh, or customize, I should say, the design of your green infrastructure practice. And these are just a couple examples of how that can be done uh, to standard infiltration test methodologies. Give consideration to the proximity of infiltrating practices to any existing infrastructure, uh, in particular building foundations. Uh, again, this is a practice that we funded a few years ago, uh, and uh, this wasn't uh, addressed adequately on the plans. Uh, we learned a lot from it as far as uh, placing a permeable pavement system just within a few feet of the uh, foundation of the building. Uh, if the building waterproofing is not adequate, uh, keep in mind you're you're encouraging water to infiltrate next to it. Uh, so you got to make sure um, that the appropriate setbacks from the infiltration area to the building foundations are met and or that proper waterproofing of the building foundation uh, is part of your design. 
OK, so those are the things that apply to any or pretty much all green infrastructure stormwater control measures. Uh, so we'll jump into the construction phase as well and the considerations that should be given uh, while the practice is being constructed. Uh, at this point, you would have a solid design, all details, all notes, everything a contractor needs to build the project. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, now you're at the phase of making sure that it's built properly uh, so that its function is achieved. Uh, I like to refer to it as, as how to not mess it up. OK, um, be very careful about not ruining your stormwater control measure as it's being constructed. Uh, as I mentioned, and this won't be the last time you hear it, uh, putting these practices in place before the the area that drains to it is permanently stabilized is a red flag and will likely result in additional costs to you to either replace or uh, perform additional actions to uh, fix the issues that were caused by the problem. Again, we include extreme pictures to drive the point home, um, but this bioretention cell, which is not one of our projects, a um, uh, significant amount of sediments were allowed to be conveyed to it um, without proper controls, and therefore now all that sediment has to be removed um, before that bioretention cell can be fully functional. Um, you know, I like the picture on the left there about the guy who poured the concrete. You know, he uh, he had every intention of making it look nice, and it did look nice. And you know, surprise, the uh, the golden retriever at the balcony above him wanted to play with his tennis ball at the same time. So surprises can happen. Unexpe uh, unexpected things do happen, and that is understandable. Uh, but keeping sediment out of your practices is not. Uh, something that it would be a surprise if you're putting them in before the area is stabilized that drains to it. Follow your construction schedule. Your contractor needs to know what that construction schedule is to make sure uh, that the practices are being put in at the right time. And certain practices that have multiple, or certain projects that have multiple practices, there's a logical sequence of how those should go in to make sure uh, that they work properly. Um, you know, the instructions for the SpongeBob SquarePants cake look easy, but sometimes um, the actual execution of that, of that uh, recipe may not quite go as planned uh, without following it correctly. Your contractor should understand that um, when they're constructing the infiltrating practices, a lot of times as that one specific note indicated earlier, uh, that the underlying subsoil, uh, the top of your excavation uh, should be scarified, uh, should be scratched up uh, instead of smeared with a flat bucket. Uh, the toothed bucket is, is what accomplishes this. Uh, it just increases the ability of water to infiltrate below the practice into the underlying soils. Um, <clears throat> it's not a perfect system, but it's certainly much better than if somebody had smeared it uh, like the bottom right hand picture shows. Again, keep sediment out. We cannot stress this enough. Um, you see some examples. Again, uh, the bioretention cell on the left is um, in place. Looks like it's done. Uh, certainly there is some silt fence that's shown around it. I'm not a fan of silt fence myself. I've been doing this for 20 plus years and rarely does it work properly, um, mainly due to shoddy construction of it. Um, but uh, we want to make sure that we avoid that potential as much as possible. Sometimes these practices have to go in before the area is stabilized completely. Uh, that's when you want to watch your weather forecast as well. Uh, if you, if day one, uh, or I, I shouldn't say day one, but one of the days um, where you're scheduled to put the bioretention cell in and you know it won't be able to be stabilized around it until two or three days later. If there's heavy rain called for in that two or three day window, that should be postponed. Uh, that bioretention cell construction should be postponed. That's the ideal way of doing it. I understand that contractors are under a lot of time constraints, um, but again, this is your project. You hire the folks. You need to watch over that to make sure that those avoidable concerns are addressed. 
All right, the contractor should be referring to all the applicable notes, of course, uh, goes without saying. Uh, this is an example here, um, something very simple. Note number eight is what I've identified in the plan view and the corresponding uh, utility notes that are typical of any design plan. <clears throat> the uh, idea here is that, um, you know, there's certain sections of the underdrain system of this permeable paver parking lot uh, that are supposed to have perforated pipe and they're supposed to have solid pipes. And it's important and there's a reason for that. Uh, so it's important to uh, make sure that um, that is understood by your contractor. Otherwise, not doing one or the other could have negative consequences on the full function of your practice. And as built drawings um, are something that may or may not be needed. Uh, quite often, um, I shouldn't say quite often, but occasionally um, a project goes in uh, per the design and something has to be tweaked um, that isn't something that would necessarily need to be redesigned. Perhaps an elevation changes slightly, perhaps a dimension changes slightly because of something that was encountered that was not expected. And that's perfectly fine usually. Uh, certainly, we like to know about those things before changes are made. However, uh, as-built drawings will uh, be very important to you and to us in the long term um, because we want to know exactly what was put in. Uh, you know, there's a design. A design is a proposal, in effect, <laughs> the way I look at it. Uh, but the as-builts are the absolute of what was constructed and reflect any minor changes to a um, practice that was implemented. And then, of course, if there are any changes to a design um, in the field, uh, certainly those changes as needed would need to be reflected in your operation and maintenance plan uh, if that is impacted in any way by it. OK, we talked about infiltration testing during the design phase, and keep in mind that was doing infiltration testing for the design only. Um, and you would do that in the approximate location at the approximate depth of your practices. On occasion, you may need to do infiltration infiltration testing um, during construction. Uh, the good thing about this is that you know exactly where your practice is going at this point, and you know exactly how deep it's going to be to know uh, to kind of pinpoint where that infiltration testing should be performed. Um, so this is not. Um, typically required, uh, but uh, certain circumstances do demand it. So just be aware uh, that uh, there may be two phases of infiltration testing that you do that could affect your design in the long term. And it's important to know that uh, when you're dealing with infiltration practices, uh, that uh, they sh you should avoid wet weather situations when they're being installed. Um, the the image of the raindrop, the single raindrop impacting the ground on the left is the, is the primary reason. <clears throat> uh, every little raindrop is a tiny bomb and every little bomb dislodges soil. Uh, and when that soil is dislodged, it's easily carried and conveyed away by flowing surface water. Uh, so that is why you get a lot of sediments during construction phases uh, of all during a rainstorm. Uh, the soil structure can be grasped drastically impacted if it's being conveyed over by equipment uh, while it's wet versus while it's dry. And that's kind of what the pictures in the middle and the right hand side are supposed to be demonstrating there. Uh, you can see it would be tough to scarify a wet soil, um, but not so terribly hard to do when it's in a dry con uh, condition. The contractor needs to ensure that the specifications for materials are followed. Um, in particular, uh, green infrastructure practices require a lot of clean material. Uh, again, fine sediments within stone are bad. Uh, so you'll see a lot of the specifications call for washed stone, and that's generally what it should look like, versus what you see on the right hand side here. Uh, this was an actual photo from a delivery that was made at one of our funded projects. You can see how much small debris and fine material that has been mixed in with the what was supposed to be washed stone. Uh, that is problematic. That will clog systems and, and your infiltrating practice will not perform adequately as intended. 
Uh, so when deliveries are made, uh, somebody should be watching over these things because we not we cannot be there at all times. And that's something that should be placed on your uh, project manager, whether that be your design engineer yourselves or even your contractor. <clears throat> Ensure that any planting specifications are followed. Um, and this example here is referring to mulching. Uh, this would be one of the last things done on any type of vegetative practice, uh, in particular if it had some trees on it. Um, you've probably heard the term volcano mulching. <laughs> That's what you see on the right hand side there where the mulch uh, kind of covers the collar of the tree um, versus the image on the left. The detail shows that the mulch isn't supposed to go up against the trunk of the tree. Uh, that does have impacts on the long term health of the tree and the growth, the proper growth of the root structure. So again, following details, following specifications for everything about your project is important. OK, uh, so a few more slides on the general overview. Let's we've covered design phase. We've covered the construction phase. Now let's cover the maintenance phase, short term and long term. Uh, so this really can be summed up as knowing what to look for when your project is done and knowing how to identify problems and remedy those problems. So um, and my apologies to folks that have seen this many, many times because you already know the answer to this, but a little fun quiz. Um, I'm going to show you some images. I want you to identify what do they have in common? Bigfoot, unicorns, a baboon bird, Nessie, spray on wrapping paper, a perfect system of government, and a man-made feature that no that requires no maintenance whatsoever. The answer is they don't exist. None of those things exist, especially the baboon bird <laughs> and the um, the fact that I don't know of any man-made feature that does not require maintenance. All practices will require maintenance, short term and long term, and that maintenance need, uh, the cost to do it may fluctuate from year to year. Um, I like to think of bioretention cells shown here as an example are like a small child. Yeah, that newborn bioretention cell requires quite a bit of tender loving care the first few years of its life. Uh, otherwise, it won't do so well, just like a child. Um, as a father, I can appreciate this too. Mm -hmm. The um, but as that bioretention cell matures, it it demands uh, perhaps some less lesser maintenance because it's become established and it knows. Uh, how to kind of maintain itself in effect more so than it did when it was a, a young bioretention cell. Uh, so you can appreciate the fact that there may be a lot more input and resources needed to get that thing established, get those plants established uh, before they can uh, kind of self-sustain themselves in the long term. Uh, so budgeting for short term first year maintenance versus long term budgeting uh, is important. Of course, there are standards and uh, manuals you can refer to. Uh, the one we always like to point folks, folks toward is the uh, one that was developed specifically for the state of Ohio, uh, maintaining stormwater control measures. And in this book, uh, the link is at the bottom there. Uh, in this book, um, uh, you'll see information for all kinds of stormwater control measures, uh, including all the green infrastructure type practices that we typically fund. Uh, in them, uh, using bioretention as an example here, it gives you an overview of what bioretention is all about. Uh, it talks about uh, typical maintenance considerations that need to be referred to on any bioretention cell. And then it also talks about uh, typical routine and non-routine maintenance activities that may need to be performed. Uh, and then in the end, for each type of practice is an inspection and maintenance checklist that is typical of most uh, standard uh, bioretention cells in this case. Uh, but again, all of these types of documents are available for every type of green infrastructure and stormwater control measure that's in that book. Please refer to it. <clears throat> OK, um, I'm going to ask Jessica, are there any questions in the chat at this time? Because we're going to start diving into the specifics of each practice now. Um, no, Elizabeth. Said, heads up, I think that is a bad link now. 
Oh, okay. For the uh, for the uh, manual for this. Okay. Yeah, we okay. will. Let me take a note, and we will. I forgot to check that. Um, we'll get you the right link uh, after, and we'll send that out to everybody. Nothing else. All right. Cool. Okay. Uh, so the practices that we are funding for 2023 cycle are bioretention, uh, rainwater harvesting. We have a couple cisterns. Uh, permeable pavement, always a very popular practice, and we have some underground infiltration detention systems. Uh, we also have one green roof. Uh, we're not going to cover the green roof, and I did give the heads up to that party um, because uh, we only have one. Uh, this particular party has already successfully uh, put a green roof in for their phase one, uh, and they have a design only award this year to uh, prepare for a phase two of another green roof on their property. Uh, so um, don't know if those folks joined us today or not, uh, but um, they were given the exemption, if you will, <laughs> today if they wanted it. So, all right, so let's talk bioretention first. All right, just quick recap, and this is probably preaching to the choir here, um, but bioretention is a small scale uh, practice. It's typically vegetated and it's kind of, it's an inverted landscaping bed is how I like to, uh, describe it to folks. It's typically or it's always in a depression because uh, you want stormwater to flow into it and, and be treated by it. Uh, the drainage areas to it are relatively small. Uh, most often going to it are rooftops and or uh, parking lots, roadways, uh, impervious areas. Uh, the stormwater is designed to be conveyed to it and then uh, the runoff percolates through the soil and through the plants um, and some of its uptake up uptaken by the plants. I guess that's a word. Um, but that process of passing through that three to four feet depth of soil and stone, uh, there's a lot of physical, chemical, and biological things that are happening there that um, uh, that's the magic. Uh, that's what uh, helps to purify that water. And if the soils in place are good enough, a lot of water can infiltrate into the ground as well. Uh, so bottom line, clean more, more cleaner water is uh, discharged either into the ground or off into through the underdrain back into the storm system. All right, so again, as I promised, um, each one of these practices, we're going to talk about specific design, specific construction, specific maintenance issues related to each one. Uh, if you do not have a bioretention cell in your uh, design, uh, this will kind of FYI information for you. Perhaps you'll think about one in the future. Um, but uh, let's dive into this. Uh, so for uh, just again, a quick recap, uh, bioretention, the design phase, uh, the general information we've already covered is to use accepted standards, make sure you can get to it, accessibility, uh, prepare the proper schedule, make sure that things are incorporated in your design that aid and simplify inspection and maintenance, include notes and details as needed, provide for flood routing as needed, make sure material specifications are uh, identified properly, um, make sure that the appropriate, appropriate, oh, let me skip ahead here. Um, those were the standards. Now, I guess I should mention that in the, in the next coming slides, we made some assumptions. Um, we're assuming that the design is proper for the bioretention cell, meaning, um, that the filter bed area is sized accordingly to the drainage area flowing to it. Uh, typically, the filter bed area is about 5% in the size of the watershed's impervious area to it. We're assuming that the, you have an adequate outlet, that, that if there were groundwater issues, existing groundwater issues, that those have been properly addressed so the, so the practice functions properly that all setbacks have been met. Uh, we talked about setbacks from buildings because of infiltration concerns, but also setbacks from property lines and roads and, and the like. And um, a little more detail on the assumption of the filter bed area. We like to drive this point home. Again, the, the point is make sure your filter, your, your, your flat portion of your bioretention cell is what's doing all the work. And that's traditionally your filter bed area. So in this bioretention cell that picks up some street runoff, uh, you may think that the bioretention cell is the red boundary, uh, sidewalk to, to back of curb. 
that that's what's serving as the full size of the bioretention cell. And let's just say that's 500 square feet for, for argument's sake. Um, you know, in effect, that may be 500 square feet and your design call for a 500 square foot bioretention cell to adequately treat the water. But when you look at this, you know, there's there's a low depressional area in the middle and the sides are high. Um, the yellow contour is supposed to kind of describe that. So in effect, in this particular bioretention cell, the green area is the only area that's doing any real work. So if you need a 500 square foot bioretention cell, that green area is what should be the 500 square feet, not the red boundary. So please, um, this is something we paid close attention to during the design phase uh, when we're reviewing plans, uh, but uh, please note this uh, for future reference. All right, bioretention um, has a lot of unique features to it, one being the type of pretreatment uh, that is recommended on these. And not all of them have pretreatment, but certainly it aids in maintenance. Um, you can have a four bay, I'll just go clockwise around these. Uh, you can have a four bay to collect heavy sediments, that often grass filter strips work uh, quite well uh, to polish up some, some flow before um, uh, the <clears throat> water gets into the bioretention cell. Uh, this gravel verge, uh, which is on the edge of the contributing impervious area. Uh, a gravel verge is basically a one foot deep by one foot wide trench filled with clean gravel. The idea is that that acts kind of like a four bay, that the sediment coming off the pavement will kind of stay in that gravel verge before it gets conveyed to the bioretention cell itself. And then there's some proprietary uh, practices as well. <clears throat> um, the one on the lower right hand side or corner of the picture here is a, a product called a rain guardian and um, it's specifically designed to capture debris and sediments before that gets for that flow of water gets into the actual infiltration bed itself okay um, all right so the next thing uh, now that you know how to deal with pretreatment. Uh, another design issue is how does water actually enter into the bioretention cell itself? And uh, the idea here is to kind of demonstrate uh, how curb cuts can work. Um, if the curb or if the bioretention cell is in a sump or a low point of say a parking lot, uh, similar to the picture on the left, it's relatively easy to get the water to get into it. Uh, you put your curb cuts at the low point and the water really has no place to go other than into the bioretention cell. Uh, pretty simple to describe. Uh, but the picture on the right, um, when the when there's a slope uh, and you're putting in a bioretention cell along that slope or, or a bio swale, for example, um, you can use curb cuts, uh, but quite frequently, if those curb cuts aren't designed properly, that water will just keep shooting down the road and never enter your bioretention cell. So one way to overcome this is to put in drop inlets along that curb, uh, as that picture shows, that forces the water to drop down and then into the, the actual practice itself. So this is just one way to overcome that challenge on slopes. Uh, there are other ways to do it too, uh, but again, the idea is if you have a slope that you're dealing with, uh, make sure it's properly addressed. And we'll, we'll keep an eye on the design as well. Uh, curb cuts, um, you know, that's where the water is entering. So you have a concentrated flow of water that can be quite erosive. Uh, so having the proper stabilization at the base of that curb cut is important. Um, you can see the naughty and nice pictures I've included here of uh, using uh, proper size stone, on the left side might be a little overkill, but we sure as heck know that that's not gonna move. Uh, the right-hand side, uh, improperly sized stone was used and it simply got washed away. And now the integrity of the parking lot is in danger as well. Uh, so there are reasons to make sure that you use the right um, materials. We don't want the actual practice to contribute sediment to the filter bed. OK, that's the last thing we want is to see erosion happening at the inlet that where those sediments get conveyed to the flat bed of your bioretention cell. 
does the same kind of, kind of damage uh, that would happen if you constructed it before the drainage area was properly stabilized. OK, um, a little note on uh, a design feature that's often incorporated into bioretention cells, and this is uh, what we refer to as an upturned elbow. I'm going to bring my pointer up here. Uh, so this is a cross section of a bioretention cell detail on your left hand side here, uh, and you can see um, the under drain. Uh, let's see the soils up top, the plants are up top and the water kind of filtrates through the soil into the gravel layers uh, and then uh, a typical under drain would allow that water to discharge down at this elevation uh, of that under drain into your outlet structure which then gets carried off to the storm sewers or wherever it goes uh, and that's represented by this lower pipe on the image to the right we often encourage designers to put what we call this upturned elbow on <clears throat> the practice itself simply for the purpose of increasing the potential of stormwater infiltration, thereby decreasing the volume to the combined sewer system. What this does is um, when it rains, um, and this, if this elbow is not here, all water that gets into the system down to the lower elevation is eventually discharged. Uh, with the upturned elbow, if we place a cap and block this lower pipe, that upturned elbow um, establishes a new elevation, a higher elevation, that so only water up to the red dot there can uh, discharge from the system, and therefore all the water below that pipe elevation uh, now has the potential to infiltrate into the ground um, before the next rain event hits. Um, so it really depends on how well your soils infiltrate. Uh, there are um, uh, water quality considerations uh, or benefits, I should say, that are achieved by by doing this, even if you don't get more infiltration. Um, but um, uh, we like to see these. Uh, the picture on the right is an example of how this was done uh, in a one of the projects that we funded recently. OK, we talked about infiltration testing already, so I'll kind of breeze through that. Uh, you may need to do it to complete your design of your practice. Uh, depending on what the goals of the project are. Um, what type of mulch do you use on a bioretention cell? That needs to be specified during your design phase. You can certainly use stone mulch. Uh, another great option is shredded bark, but what we don't like to see is wood chips, okay? Wood chips will float readily, um, whereas stone obviously will not, and shredded bark um, tends to kind of bind itself together and form kind of a uniform mat, if you will. Uh, you do get some floating debris, of course, um, but for the most part, the, the vast majority of it uh, stays in place and is locked in place. Uh, so making sure that the right mulch is used. Um, again, it's an aesthetic concern whether you use stone or shredded bark. Uh, the design needs to make sure that the soil media is proper. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, bioretention soils are generally about 80% sand. Uh, any less than that, and you're asking for trouble in effect. But you do need to make sure that you have enough organic matter in the material as well uh, that will support plant life if uh, you do have plants on your bioretention cell. And then plant selection itself during the design phase, uh, there's lots of things to consider. There's so many options, we're not gonna get into those, but some of the general considerations that you should give are, primarily aesthetics. Um, how do you want it to look in the end? How does it blend into your, the rest of your landscaping on your property? Uh, consider line of sight. If your practice uh, of bioretention is near uh, where uh, trucks and cars will be ingressing and egressing out of your property, uh, don't call for plants that are gonna block that view uh, and cause a dangerous situation uh, leaving or entering uh, your parking lot. Um, make sure you understand that a bioretention cell, uh, the moisture uh, available to plant life it varies dramatically. Um, you know, during a rain event, it can be completely saturated. Uh, during a drought period, it's going to be completely dry. You need to pick plants that are going to be able to survive those conditions. Uh, salt tolerance is often something you need to consider uh, if you're capturing parking lot or street runoff. 
Uh, only not all plants can survive those salty uh, conditions that occur during the winter season. Uh, so make sure you pick the right ones for your situation. Uh, sunlight needs, obviously some plants survive in full sun only, some survive in full shade only, um, and there are many in between. Uh, so make sure you pick the right ones for the, uh, the, the light conditions that are expected long-term. And ease of maintenance. Um, don't pick plants that are hard to maintain. <laughs> I mean, you certainly can uh, for aesthetic reasons, but be aware of the fact that there are many that are simple to maintain and many that are not. Uh, one little uh, point of advice that we give you, uh, we have seen many times where bioretention cells have this uh, amazing plant palette, if you will, uh, that incorporates all different species scattered throughout the, the project. Um, and it, day one, it looks beautiful. Uh, year two or so, it may not look so beautiful because it'll be hard to distinguish what are the plants and what are the weeds. So we make consider species that you're familiar with, consider planting them in, in large groupings so that they look more obvious together. Um, but again, uh, and, and I should say, uh, and limit the number of species um, to three to five is what we recommend as maximum. <clears throat> mainly because you start getting into too many, uh, you're going to see, again, it's just going to be difficult to tell what's a weed and what's not. All right, um, enough about the design phase specific to bioretention, so let's talk about the construction phase specific to bioretention. Again, uh, just that what we've already covered, follow the schedule, keep sediment out of it, uh, look at the notes and details. And these are all things for your contractor to consider. Uh, make sure the weather is proper, Make sure that um, the soil is scarified if that's the practice demands it. Uh, use non-contaminated materials. Um, if you have any revisions to the plan, make sure that operation and maintenance plan reflects those revisions as necessary. Provide as-built drawings. And um, I'll mention here milestone inspections. Uh, if you've worked with us before, you know that uh, we like to be at the active construction site at key milestones of the project implementation. Uh, and during pre-construction meetings, we give you that time and give your contractor and your design engineer and you a schedule of when we would like to be called to the site when certain things are being implemented as far as the bioretention layers, if you will. All right, uh, a few other things uh, to think about. Um, avoid compaction at all times in the bioretention cell, especially on the subsoil after the initial excavation is done. Uh, the picture upper left, um, running equipment back and forth through it might be economical, but it's not good if you want those soils to, in, to be infiltrating as much as they can. That is uh, unnecessary compaction of the underlying soils. Um, so the options are to use equipment that can reach further into the practice, like the middle photo. Um, quite often to avoid compaction, hand work is needed as well. Um, you know, in this day and age, you know, we like to use equipment. It sure is efficient, but there are necessary times when doing things by hand still is the best option. Um, <clears throat> if there's a need, or I should say there will be a need um, to make sure you got the right amount of soil. Uh, in your bioretention cell. Um, one way to help uh, make sure that uh, you guard against uh, unforeseen settling of the soil uh, is to water it down as it's being implemented. Um, the It's not such a big issue for the stone. Uh, it's relatively easy to perform some minor compaction of the stone layers that are at the bottom. Uh, but that soil layer, when you get it and it's nice and dry, it, it's in effect fluffy, all right? And um, uh, you'll see where when you fill it up to the high level that you want it, a few weeks later, after a few rainfalls, it'll settle and you'll lose three, four, six inches of um, quantity simply because of settling. One way to overcome that is simply to water it down, to place it in, in one foot increments, water it down, add the next foot, water it down, uh, that will guard against um, uh, the dramatic settling effect. Uh, and of course, uh, just add a little bit more. It's recommended that if you um, add additional 5% of the volume that's needed, uh, that that should account for this settlement issue. 
There it is again, folks. Keep sediment out. I cannot say it enough. Uh, every precaution should be made to not install that bioretention cell until its contributing drainage area is stabilized. Um, if if the uh, pretreatment option you choose is a grass filter strip, give full consideration to using sod versus seed and mulch. Um, obviously, uh, as you can see, the use of sod for a filter strip uh, is has an immediate benefit, whereas using seed and mulch um, can be hit or miss. Uh, you might have ideal conditions and you might be able to water it or you might have uh, perfect rain events coming uh, that that grass will grow readily. Um, but in my experience, uh, more often than not, it doesn't grow readily. Uh, it needs a lot of TLC to get it to what, what that sod would look like. Uh, so again, if you're using grass filter strips, consider using sod in those specific areas, seed and mulch everywhere else that is not relevant. Um, <clears throat> if you call, if your plan calls for using trees in your bioretention cell, um, you know, there should be specifications of how to stake those trees. Uh, make sure your contractor follows those specifications so you don't get the uh, the leaning tree you see at the, in the middle picture there. OK, um, specific maintenance related issues to bioretention long term. All right. Um, in general, uh, we've kind of talked about this already. Um, you will need to maintain your practice. <laughs> there is no question about it. Uh, and the expense to do so will likely be higher that first year or two than it is uh, beyond. So keep that in mind. Uh, and of course, refer to the, uh, the manual uh, that we previously referred you to. Uh, again, there is a specific section for bioretention uh, that helps you perform uh, an inspection when necessary. Um, gives you all the nitty gritty details and gives you that checklist you need to remind you of what you should be looking for. Uh, quite often design engineers will use these uh, standardized inspection reports, um, but you know, feel free to create your own that's more user friendly for your needs if you feel the need to do so. Um, we certainly do not require you to use this version of it, um, but we will review any version that you provide to us uh, during the design phase. Um, uh, maintenance of the pretreatment is necessary frequently, uh, whether you use a four bay or not. Um, uh, removing the accumulated sediments from that feature are important so that it remains to have it, the volume it needs to, to address the next rainfall event. Uh, make sure when you inspect your project that it's draining properly. If you're seeing standing water in your bioretention cell 24 to 48 hours after it stopped raining, uh, you may have a problem. You may have a clogging issue. You may have a faulty underdrain of some sort. Um, that's when you want to look at it uh, during a rain event and immediately after the rain event. Are your inlets uh, stable? Um, we talked about that earlier, um, making sure that if you see erosion at your inlets, that that's addressed right away. Um, is the vegetation you call for in good condition? Have you been watering and weeding as needed, which is really critical that first year or two. Uh, do you need to perform trimming and pruning, which may be more critical at certain seasons, uh, like a spring cleanup, or after your practice matures after four or five years, your your bushes and shrubs you put in there may be a little unruly and need to be tamed a bit. Um, plants may need to be thinned. Um, and then of course, winterization may need to be performed as well, cutting things back so that you're ready for the next growth uh, in the next spring. The infiltration bed itself, uh, some key things to look for uh, is making sure that, you know, it's not being clogged up with sediments uh, to make sure uh, that it's being mulched properly, uh, that water is getting into it adequately. Um, and uh, you, you may recognize the reference to Caddyshack there. Uh, you want to get rid of all the gophers, all right? We have seen many times where uh, we have varmints, if you will, burrowing into the bioretention cell. It's super easy to dig in, and remember, it's 80% sand. Um, the, the pathway of least resistance uh, applies to critters and rodents as well. Your outlet and overflow features in your uh, practice uh, need to be looked at. Um, I like the picture on the 
the left hand side there. This is one I took several years ago. Again, not one of our funded projects. Uh, this is from my previous life. Uh, the point of this photo is. Um, let me pull my little pointer out here. Uh, the outlet, the ponding elevation is supposed to be at the rim of this overflow structure. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's not. It's at this elevation here. And the reason for that is because uh, this rise, the six inch riser concrete collar was not um, placed on the underlying structure um, in a waterproofed manner, if you will. There was no sealant used between the sections. And so water was easily ready or readily able to pass through the gaps between there. Um, and that in effect uh, caused this practice to lose six inches of ponding depth, which is which is a significant amount in a bioretention cell, often 50% of the ponding depth. So be aware of um, when you inspect things that you see, you pay attention to those types of things. But you know, you just want to make sure that where the water comes in, where the water goes out, uh, that those are all functioning properly. All right, and then just some helpful hints for bioretention first year maintenance. Um, the typical things you'll need to worry about during your first year maintenance is removing any sediments that may have got into it, removing any debris that might have got into the pretreatment practices as well. Um, making sure that the inlets and the side slopes are stable. Um, vegetation will give you the most um, heartache, if you will. Uh, you may need to do a lot of watering initially. If you happen to get a dry spell right after you plant things, you want your plants to survive. They are not cheap. Uh, you want to make sure that mulching is maintained uh, and placed properly and that, you know, eventually you're going to have your first winter to deal with uh, that any proper winterization or spring cleanup is addressed as well. Uh, readily remove trash and debris from the planting bed itself. And then again, take care of the gophers. You don't want gophers. Uh, and then ensure that the overflow feature of your practice uh, is not clogged uh, as well. <clears throat> okay, so that was quick as far as the last points of bioretention, but uh, Jessica, any chat questions regarding bioretention at all? Yeah, there was a chat question, but Derek okay. handle it, but okay. when Melissa Miller had her hand raised. Okay, uh, Melissa, go ahead and ask your question. No, it was answered, thank you. Okay, great. Okay. <clears throat> All right, um, let's talk about cisterns now. And uh, there will be a break coming up, so don't mm -hmm. worry. <laughs> I think it's after cisterns. <laughs> okay, so give me about 10 minutes here. All right, so cisterns, uh, two different options. Uh, they can be buried underground. Um, as you can see that uh, there's one being installed on the left-hand side there, or they can be above ground. Uh, it's all a matter of uh, what kind of aesthetics you're comfortable with. And you know we have some above ground cisterns that are purposely done so because the uh, property owner wants you to see it, uh, to drive the point home that, hey, look what we're doing here. We're collecting and harvesting rainwater. All right, there are typical components to any cistern. Um, let me pull my fun little pointer up here again. <clears throat> All right, so typically there's a catchment, which is uh, generally a rooftop for the most part. Uh, the roof drains into it. It uh, doesn't have to be a roof. You can have an underground cistern that collects rainwater from a parking lot. doesn't really matter, but from what we typically fund, it's a rooftop. You have a gutter system that conveys that water down uh, into some downspouts. Um, we're going to talk about this first flush diverter in detail later, but that's a pretreatment option. Um, but then as that water is filtered and pretreated as necessary, it is conveyed into the, the vessel, the main storage tank. Uh, which if it cannot be drained by gravity, just with a, a, a valve and a hose, it may have uh, a pump system in it. And that pump system might go to a pressurizer tank, depending again, how you intend to use the water. Um, so obviously if there's a pump and a pressurizing tank of some type, uh, there's gonna need to be some type of uh, electrical um, component involved to plug those things into. Um, but quite often cisterns are gravity drain where they don't have those features. Again, it's all dependent on what um, what you need. All right, um, <clears throat> water distribution. 
so how do you use the water? Um, a lot of times the cisterns are used for on-site irrigation. Uh, they can potentially be used for domestic use, um, flushing toilets, uh, that type of thing. Typically not used for drinking water for reasons. Uh, we have had a few that use it for washing vehicles with proper treatment first. Um, but this can uh, this dist distribution system could be uh, kind of controlled through an automated process, uh, like again, like a um, a uh, electric switch of some type that kicks a pump on and pressurizes that water, or it can be done passively, like a gravity uh, discharge um, valve and hose type setup. Um, we want to make sure that you. You know, if you're asking for a cistern, there's got to be a dedicated use for that water. That tank has to be drained uh, on a regular basis. Otherwise, it does no good as far as achieving the goals of um, the grant itself, which is removing water uh, from the combined sewer system. Uh, so uh, we understand cisterns are a seasonal thing, potentially. Uh, they cannot be used in the winter, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, that's the climate we deal with. Um, but um, when it is being used, we want to make sure that there's a dedicated use of that water. And you got to always make sure that there's some type of overflow system uh, in case it gets filled up during a large storm event. <clears throat> OK, so quick recap on the general considerations. Again, there are standards for cisterns. Make sure you can access them. Uh, obviously, above ground systems are more easily accessed than underground systems, um, but certainly uh, we'll get into those details again. Uh, construction scheduling uh, needs to be addressed. Do things that simplify inspections. One example on a cistern would be a water level indicator to know where the water level is if it's not a transparent vessel. Um, make sure that there's all the notes and details, that flood routing is accounted for as far as overflow, and that all uh, specifications of the types of materials, uh, primarily in this case, the pipe and plumbing that's needed are uh, all spelled out accordingly. Some assumptions we've made uh, in preparing the next uh, few slides that you'll see. Uh, we've assumed um, that the catchment area, the roof in most cases, um, that you've selected the proper type of pretreatment uh, for the type of uh, or for the surface water that's getting into it. Uh, the debris off a roof is much different than the debris off a parking lot, for example. So that the pretreatment device needs to be accounted for accordingly. That the drainage area has been determined to be correct. Um, you know, you your cistern will have um, you have a need for water. We're assuming uh, and a certain volume of water. Um, so you need to make sure that the drainage area feeding your cistern provides that volume that you need uh, or more in some cases, uh, and that your cistern is holds enough water for, for the, the demand that you anticipate as well. Um, water is not light. It's about eight pounds per gallon. Uh, so if you have a 500 gallon cistern, you can imagine you've got a 4,000 pounds of weight that you have to support. So having a proper base, um, given the size of your cistern is important. Uh, smaller cisterns that are above ground, uh, can be supported by a framework of uh, uh, of wood of some type, uh, but when they get quite large, often a concrete pad is the better option. Uh, obviously, underground cisterns, uh, that's not much of a concern. Uh, we're assuming you have a proper overflow uh, that discharges safely and that all setbacks uh, related to buildings and side yards and uh, from the street, the right of way are being followed accordingly as well. Uh, a couple more design assumptions uh, that you're picking a durable product, um, that the quality uh, of your product is going to last you a number of years. Uh, we have seen some situations where less um, reliable products have been used and they've had cracking and leaking and all kinds of problems that caused some heartache to the owner. Uh, so make sure you invest in a, in a, a product that has high reviews. Um, you may have to refer to plumbing codes depending on how you use the water. Uh, so make sure that you've done that. Um, and uh, sunlight exposure uh, needs to be addressed as well. We're assuming you've done that. 
more so for above ground cisterns uh, ob for obvious reasons. Um, but the more translucent or more transparent your vessel is, the higher likelihood you're going to have algae growth within it, which is a, a maintenance headache. Uh, the system should be flushable uh, so that you can clean it properly uh, with, an, uh, with a valve or a drain at the bottom of it. Again, easier for above ground than below ground, but still necessary for all types. Uh, that you can easily access your tank as well. <clears throat> okay, as promised, I thought I, I would show you a little bit about uh, some popular pre-treatment options for a cistern. Uh, that first flush diverter is a fun little product. Um, if you remember that picture you had earlier, and I'll kind of bounce from photo to photo here, <clears throat> you have a downspout feeding this particular cistern uh, on the right hand side here. So that downspout would be coming down on the left side of your screen here and feeding water uh, into this first flush diverter. Uh, what this is, is just an extension, a vertical extension of the pipe. Uh, the first flush should have the most sediments in it. It's rinsing off your rooftop in this example. So you would expect the first flush to be the dirtiest water. <clears throat> the way this works is that that dirty water is goes down into that vertical pipe first, and there's a floating ball within that vertical pipe that rises as the water fills it up. So the sediments are going down, the ball is rising up, and the ball eventually gets to the top where it, it sits and doesn't go any further, and therefore the remainder of the water bypasses that vertical section and goes to your vessel or your tank. Uh, when the rain is done, um, you open up the valve at the bottom of that diverter and you drain it out and all that sediment should come with it. Um, is it 100% effective? No, but it does a great deal of work um, and it should be something that's considered for a rooftop setup. Screens as well help filter out leaf debris, tree seeds, that type of thing, um, but these are things that need frequent maintenance as well. All right, um, you may need to treat your water depending on how you're using it. If you're using it for irrigation, um, may not be as critical. Uh, we have had a few situations where folks um, use it for washing vehicles, uh, so and it's pressurized so that overspray can be inhaled. Uh, so there are UV treatment systems and filtering systems on the discharge pipes to make sure it's safe for human contact. <clears throat> so be aware. Uh, depending on how you use your water, you may need to invest in a treatment system of some type. Other design features uh, that you should take into consideration, specific to cisterns, um, depending on the type of vessel that you use, uh, the plumbing or the drain pipes uh, need to be correct and need to be routed properly um, to perform maintenance on your system down the road. You want to have a, the ability to completely dewater your, your vessel as easily as possible. Uh, so providing that in your design is important. Uh, water level indicators um, that even though you can't see the water through the opaque um, uh, vessel, the uh, there are indicators that work that show you on the outside of the vessel uh, where that water level would be. And it's recommended that you do that if you are concerned with that. Um, and depending on your situation, you may want some type of alarm set up um, if there are uh, reasons for it. Um, we would hope that emergency situations are avoided through proper plumbing, um, but uh, there are options to, um, if it's critical, if a, if a failure of your system would cause substantial issues for you, alarm systems are recommended uh, that would alert you to those when they happen. <clears throat> Um, so be aware that uh, how you use your water, again, may require the need for um, gravity drains or it may need uh, you to uh, implement pumps and pressurizing systems that <clears throat> use the water properly. So the image on the left, um, obviously uh, your design should account for the proper pump, the proper pressurizer. Uh, there's a lot of options to consider. Um, I should point out, you can see the, the pre-treatment options for the filter and the first flush diverter on that image as well. Uh, show you how, how it can be set up. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, if you're able to elevate your cistern, like as shown on the right hand side, uh, and you're only relying on gravity drain, um, then it's a pretty simple thing to be able to uh, use that water and to also drain the tank completely for maintenance purposes. Um, <clears throat> that could be achieved if you're on the ground as well, if you have slope to your property and the your your source, your tank is higher in elevation than your where you're going to use that water. Uh, you can still gravity drain it that way. Okay, so things to think about during the construction phase of cisterns uh, to aid in the maintenance long term. Again, recap, follow that schedule, keep sediment out of it. Not as big of an issue for cisterns unless you're picking up surface flow. Um, all those notes and details should be followed. If you have any plan revisions, make sure the operation maintenance plan reflects those, provide us those as-built drawings, and again, milestone inspections would be something we would provide to you during the pre-construction meeting. All right, um, during construction, test everything. Um, test the water tightness of all the plumbing. Uh, if you have mechanical features, pumps and pressurizing systems, uh, electrical components, make sure those are all tested. If you have alarm systems, make sure that your contractor performs all those proper tests. As you can see, there's not a lot we have on cistern construction. <laughs> uh, a couple of things to mention, uh, I just thought of, uh, make sure your base uh, is solid, um, whether it be a decking made out of wood or whether it be concrete. Um, those are important to make sure those are properly constructed um, so that you don't have failure or tipping or rollover of your vessel. All right, uh, during the maintenance phase of cisterns, things you'll want to be aware of. <clears throat> Again, uh, the manual includes information on these. Uh, your, your costs may fluctuate from year to year. There are uh, standard uh, inspection forms for cisterns as well. Uh, but the things you want to keep an eye on on a regular basis is your tank stabi stability. Um, if your tank is starting to tip or lean, that may be cause co for concern. Again, water is heavy. Uh, you don't want, especially larger tanks, falling over. That could cause quite a bit of damage. Uh, check for all leaks uh, as necessary, especially pressurized systems on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> test everything. Uh, if your filter systems, your UV treatment systems uh, likely have owner's manuals to them that suggest testing intervals, uh, your alarms would as well. Uh, you may need to perform water sampling depending on how you use your, your harvested rainwater as well. So do that as necessary for your intended use. Uh, you could have the need to flush and sanitize the system as well. Uh, the images on the left there, so, you know, a, a cistern that's translucent, uh, sunlight can kind of penetrate it, you're going to get algae growth, and that needs to be addressed on a regular basis. Um, uh, you may have critters, if you will, entering your cistern unexpectedly. I hope it's not a horse, <laughs> but um, again, we have to try to have a little fun here. Um, but uh, I, I have seen floating raccoons in rain barrels before, uh, so it can happen. Um, they can get in, but sometimes they can't get out. Uh, you may need, uh, depending on the size of your cistern, uh, you may actually need confined space entry certification to uh, get into it or hire somebody that is able to, to do that for you. And then, of course, winterization. Um, you don't want water in your plumbing system or your cistern during the winter months. Uh, ice uh, expands in volume, as we know, and it can cause havoc on the actual plumbing system and break your pipes, causing you unnecessary expense. So making sure in our neck of the woods, um, you have a winterization design uh, that allows you to bypass the flow uh, away from the cistern during those winter months. Uh, first year maintenance, typical things that we wanna make you aware of that we ant anticipate you'll need to deal with uh, is removing any sediments and debris from the pretreatment practices on a regular basis. Uh, keeping an eye on your plumbing, your conveyance system in and out of your cistern, cleaning the tank as necessary, especially if you have a translucent material that allows sunlight uh, to penetrate it, 
<clears throat> testing those devices, uh, pumps, pressurizing systems, alarms, uh, and then of course winterization um, uh, needs as well, performing that before the freezing temperatures hit. Um, early October through um, probably early May would be your period to be aware of that. Okay, um, the slide is not showing. This is this is the clock, correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Oh, I gotta pull this up. Okay, so we're about to start a ten-minute break. Uh, any questions in the chat for Cisterns, Jessica? No, I did share the updated link to. Okay. That. All right. Yeah. So the updated link to that manual has been posted in the chat. Uh, I'm going to start the clock. Uh, keep this on your screen, and uh, folks, we'll see you in ten minutes. And I promise you. Uh, you'll stop hearing me talk for a bit. Uh, we're going to kind of switch things up a bit at the 10 minute break uh, where Jessica is going to talk about kind of change gears a little bit and talk about some reporting requirements. And then we'll jump back into a couple of the last two practices and the details related to them. All right, we'll see you in 10 minutes. OK, so we're going to get started. Thank you for my bagel break. Um, <laughs> so next we're going to talk about document submittal, kind of pivot to um, what documents are required to be submitted throughout the duration of your project being completed. Um, and with that said, there are three options that are, two of the options are basically required. The third option is as needed. Um, so option one, option one is uh, the GI program reimbursement request. Option two is the progress quarterly progress report, and then option three, if needed, is the project extension. Some of you guys have been um, completing this process if you were design only, and we're just we'll go through this, and we're actually going to do a live demo right now. So I'm going to exit out the PowerPoint. I'm going to turn. So what you want to do is go to your Internet service and you want to type in. NERSD.org. Um, here you'll see our main page and then you want to go to funding opportunities and then the green infrastructure grant program. Um, someone from the sewer district team will put the home page of the grant program in the um, comments for you guys to browse, but this is basically your home page throughout your duration of the completed of your project. Here it has everything from the um, videos that are being recorded. We are going, we are recording this O&M workshop and this will be placed um, on this web page as well next week. Um, also, there's important documents like the pre-proposal workshop slide decks, the RFP, Everything in here is um, everything you need is right on this home page. We also have our story map here. And then way below is where um, your document submittal process starts. Um, right here, um, there are bullet points here. The last bullet point instructions on how to fill it out. This is an online cover sheet what has details instructions on how to fill out all the options. So we're going to start with the reimbursement request with option one. Now the reimbursement request um, you can submit any time during your project um, that is you're constructing your project and completing your project. There's no set limit of how many times you can submit a reimbursement. Um, there are requirements when submitting a reimbursement. So when you clip option one, um, there is instructions on how to submit the reimbursement. You're, and there's two steps. Um, the step one is the request expense tracking form, and it does give you some brief instructions on how to fill it out. But letter D under step one is the link to the PDF. Now this is a fillable PDF. You want to put your project name here. 
Um, don't worry about the PO number. Um, if you don't have it, that's OK. We have it. We have it. And then you want to put the date. And then what you want to do is you want to put your invoice numbers here, your vendor information here, um, and then the amount on the invoice. Sometimes the amount on the invoice is more than an amount of the reimbursement request due to other things that are going on if, with your project. So let's say if there was a total amount of $3,000 on your invoice, but you are requesting 500, which is um, representing the green infrastructure component of your project, then that's what you want to do. But sometimes the invoice is just the amount of the green represents the GI component of your project. So you want to put that there too. And what this helps you do is it calculates your total at the bottom here, and you can fill this out as much as you want. And then what you want to do is you want to save this into your um, onto your computer anywhere on your computer because you're going to upload it in the cover seat cover sheet section. So step two with all the options, this step two all options have the cover sheet. Again, a brief information um, brief instruction on how to fill it out. Please utilize the. Um, the how to fill out the online cover sheet PDF if needed. Um, this we try to make it as user friendly as possible. So the one thing you want to do is you want to uh, make sure you have your main parcel number on here. Some projects have multiple um, parcel numbers that are associated with your project, um, but you want your main parcel number here. If you don't know it, please reach out and let me know. And you want to start typing in your parcel number to generate the parcel list. Once you've done finding your parcel number, um, two and three will automatically be filled out, so you don't have to worry about that. Once that's filled out, you want to go ahead and put your contact name and contact information here um, with the first name, last name, and email. This progress report section is required for reimbursement and quarterly progress report and um, the extension request. You want to just summarize your project. Number six, number seven, you want to describe any difficulties or delay. Please be honest with us so we understand what the delays are, any difficulties. And if there are no delays or difficulties, just say no delays or difficulties here. There's a 500 word limit. Um, but you're allowed to attach information down below, and I'll show you that in a second. Number nine, you want to enter the total amount reimbursement request that was from the expense tracking sheet here. And then you want to click um, this information here, authorized signature. Um, once you're down at the document upload section, you want this is where you uh, go ahead and upload the reimbursement tracking. Um, sorry, reimbursement request expense tracking form here. And then you want to in set um, number 12 and 13, you want to enter supporting documentation. Now supporting documentation can range from invoices and proof of payment. Um, those are canceled checks, credit card statements, receipts, invoices, anything to support your request for reimbursement and the um, expense tracking sheet um, related to the GI component of your project. And then on 13, you can go ahead and upload images or photos or any other documentation you want to go ahead and support your request here. Once you completed that, you hit submit, and then an email goes out saying you submitted a reimbursement request here. Um, and then what I get is a notification the next day of the request, and then I so I start processing the request internally. It does go through a review process before we um, issue a reimbursement check. So make sure all your documentations are correct and everything is aligned with your request. If not, there might be some delays. Typically, a reimbursement 
takes, I will, I say, give us about 10 business days to complete the reimbursement. Um, that because sometimes they come in all at once and sometimes they'll come in one at a time. So um, that's the minimum. Just give us um, 10 days. Now, if there are delays and we're trying to reach out to you, that that process might take a little bit longer. So be aware of that. Again, there is no set limit of how many times you can um, send in a reimbursement request. The next one um, I want to go through is option two, which is a quarterly progress report. Um, this is required every quarter. Um, April 30th is coming up. That's when you want to, um, that's the deadline to submit a um, quarterly progress report. The next one's in July, October, and then December. Um, before we go through the quarterly progress report, um, if you are submitting a reimbursement two weeks prior to any of these dates I mentioned, then that will count as your quarterly progress report as well. Um, again, if you are submitting a reimbursement two weeks prior to within the two weeks of these dates that are mentioned, April, July, October, and December, it's always at the end of the month then that your reimbursement will count as a quarterly progress report. There's no need to do um, another quarterly progress report if you're submitting it. So with that said, for the quarterly progress report, it's only one step. It's the online cover sheet. It looks very similar to the reimbursement. Um, again, your parcel number goes in here, and then you type it out. <clears throat> then your information will pop up. You fill out your contact information for four and five, and then the quarterly progress report as you've seen in the reimbursement section. Same concept here. The only difference is you don't have to put the amount of reimbursement here. You signed it in section nine. And then with the document upload section, here you wanna upload any images or photos related to um, the status of your project um, during construction, before construction, those information, and then 11 additional information that you choose to support your quarterly progress report. And then for option three, if needed, um, we do have a section where you can do a, a project extension. Um, let's say that you are, um, putting in a bioretention, but winter time is coming. We do sometimes see people wait to do their planting the next spring. This is where you want to inform us ahead of time, and then you want to fill out the project extension request. Um, so with that said, again, it's very similar to the reimbursement and the quarterly progress report, your parcel number, your contact information, you want to put your um, progress report um, information here and why you need the extension. And then what's difference here is the extension request date. You want to put a date in here um, to, uh, to let us know when you think your project will be completed. Again, the bioretention example, if they're doing planting, normally they'll put a end of May or June date here. Um, and they will explain we're waiting until after winter to do the planting. Um, again, these are still similar. Number 10 is authorized signature, and then the document upload section 11 with the images, and then number 12 with additional support. Again, you'll hit submit on all three options, and then you'll get an email confirmation saying you submitted which option you choose. Is there any question, Chris? Nothing in the chat. OK, great. So with that said, um, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation. And then Chris had his little break, and he will continue with permeable papers. All right, let's continue on. Yeah. OK, permeable pavement. Um, a lot of us know what that is exactly. Uh, we're simply providing a different type of parking material. 
Um, something that readily lets water into it, uh, but supports the weight of vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, whatever, what it may be. Um, <clears throat> uh, the water is able to permeate through it because there's in effect gaps in it or pathways of what for water to flow through it vertically and then get in down into a uh, storage reservoir filled with stone uh, where it can eventually reach the underlying soils. Uh, the drainage to permeable pavement uh, <clears throat> can uh, receive more flow than just the pavement itself. Um, in the right situations, you can direct roof runoff to it as well. Um, or uh, what is most common is to direct traditionally paved areas uh, to it. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. All right, uh, things to consider during the design phase of permeable pavement. And I know you've seen this many, many times, and we're going to say it one more time. Um, again, for all practices, uh, including permeable pavement, refer to standards. Permeable pavement, if it's not accessible, there's a problem, right? <clears throat> it's always going to be accessible. Um, follow a logical construction schedule. Do things and build things into the design that make it easier to maintain. <clears throat> uh, and inspect, I should say. And uh, all those notes and details must be accounted for. Make sure if something goes wrong, that water has a place to go. Um, make sure you reuse the right materials on your plan as well. All right, some assumptions that we have made in preparing these slides. <clears throat> uh, we are assuming that you have given full consideration to uh, the the amount of weight, if you will, that's going to be on your permeable pavement. What are the traffic loading uh, issues that you're going to deal with uh, as far as parking bays, as far as uh, travel lanes, uh, what type of vehicles are going to be using it, that sort of thing. Uh, we're assuming that your contributing drainage areas um, land use has been uh, given consideration. Uh, in effect, uh, all water that drains to it should uh, originate from stable ground. Uh, no sediment laden flow should be directed into your permeable pavement. All foundation offsets um, have been accounted for. We described that earlier. Um, if there's any existing high groundwater issues that those have been properly addressed. Um, that the excavated hole, if you will, uh, is relatively flat or perfectly flat, it would be ideal uh, so that water infiltrates better as well. <clears throat> All right, so um, in those assumptions, uh, one of the things we talked about are the drainage area ratios uh, that flow to permeable pavement. Um, <clears throat> All right, so with my little pointer here, I want to talk about this. Uh, so this is an image from uh, one of the projects we funded uh, a few years ago that I've kind of marked up. Uh, we have two fields of permeable pavers that were put in, and these are in effect parking bays uh, that were installed at the time. And we simply want to make sure that the traditional pavement area, the red area in the lower portion in this case, that drains to the paver field is no more than twice the size of that paver field. So that that ratio of traditional pavement to pavers or permeable pavement should be two to one at the maximum. Um, any more than that, and you're likely going to have high maintenance issues uh, because of the amount of grit and sediment that typically comes off of traditional pavement. Um, in this case, we're good. Uh, the paver field is 5,000 square feet and the drainage area to it uh, is only 7,500 square feet. So that drainage area to it could be as much as 10,000 square feet and still meet that requirement. All right, uh, under drains and elbows are something that should be considered uh, during the design phase as well. Uh, the layout in particular um, and the uh, idea of providing an upturned elbow is an option here uh, to increase the infiltration cap capability of the practice. Uh, one thing I think I might have gleaned over a little too quickly uh, when I showed the image on the upper right before, uh, the idea here of this upturned elbow, although it is to increase the ability to infiltrate water on, a, on a, any type of infiltrating practice that has an underdrain, uh, there's a chance that could be problematic 
uh, in the long run that an unforeseen situation might arise uh, where you need to lower that water level in the practice itself. And the beauty of this upturned elbow design is that all you have to do is take this cap off this lower pipe. And therefore, now you have a traditional, um, typical, I should say, under drain system in place. Um, so uh, that's the beauty of it. Uh, if you had this upturned elbow here and didn't provide this potential um, or this capability to bypass it, uh, you'd have to dig up the system to fix it. Uh, and that obviously is a lot more intrusive and costly. All right, uh, design details of the uh, permeable paver system or any type of permeable concrete or or asphalt even. A um, <clears throat> uh, couple things I want to point out here, and I should keep my pointer going here. So uh, in this case, it's it's a paver system that has the different stone layers beneath it. Um, but that under drain is you know anywhere from one to two, maybe three feet deep from the surface. Um, but um, the perforations should only be uh, within the gravel bed. Uh, where that pipe penetrates your outlet structure through the outlet structure wall, uh, and this would be the outlet structure wall, that pipe should be solid uh, from that point into the structure itself. Uh, we don't want to create, we don't want more perforations um, at the bottom of the pipe inside the structure because that just allows the practice to perhaps drain too quickly. Uh, but again, uh, these are the kinds of details that you should have on your uh, design uh, for permeable pavement as well. And of course, um, that penetration of that pipe through that structure wall uh, should be watertight as well. We don't want water leaking through the, the gaps um, that would be left behind uh, in the hole of the, of the wall of the outlet structure. So that should be a nice watertight seal so it only gets out through the pipe itself. Um, again, uh, two key design features that you should consider implementing on your permeable paver system uh, is some type of observation well. Uh, those can be flush with the top of the system, uh, so they can be driven over, uh, but this allows you to easily see uh, where the water level is at any given time, assuming that that's an easily removable cap on that observation well. Um, is your practice draining or isn't it? Uh, and that's that's one way to see if it's working right after during a rainfall and you know maybe 24 to 48 hours after rainfall to see how that water level changes. Uh, edge restraints are critical, especially for permeable pavers uh, because they can shift and move if they're not anchored in place. Uh, that's typically addressed through um, curbing, uh, concrete curbing of some type. Infiltration testing may be needed uh, during the design phase. Um, again, we've talked about this for all practices. Uh, again, it really all depends on the um, what the uh, goal of your practice is, if it has a very specific volume of water that you're trying to infiltrate. Uh, erosion and sediment control plan is critical uh, for a uh, the design phase of permeable pavement. The um, thing I want to point out here, um, you can see uh, we have a failure really of a permeable pavement system that was installed uh, many years ago, uh, not one of the project we funded just from my previous life. And um, <clears throat> uh, when you get those sediments that fill up the pathway or the gaps between the pavers, uh, you've clogged the system. And it's extremely difficult to, make, to get that out of there uh, if you've allowed that to happen. Uh, so one thing to consider, if there are vegetated areas that drain into your permeable pavers, um, you know, minimize those vegetated areas for one thing. Um, but if you have curbs, which you should, uh, between the two features, uh, if you have a curb reveal on the vegetated side of the uh, pavers, that water flowing towards the pavers uh, has an opportunity to pond behind it, and a lot of those sediments can get out before it actually jumps over that curb and into uh, the paver field itself. So keep that in mind um, uh, to provide that one to two inch reveal on the vegetated side of the curb if possible. <clears throat> All right, um, one uh, way to minimize some maintenance uh, is to avoid uh, curvature in your paver field itself. Um, the problem with that 
is that uh, when you have curvature, uh, you need to uh, cut the stones to fit those curves. Uh, and when you, if you see along this curve here, uh, some of those paver bricks are quite tiny. Uh, the smaller they are, the more likely they are to move uh, along an edge restraint of some type. If you're able to provide edge restraints that fit exact full blocks of pavers, uh, you're going to have less potential movement and therefore less maintenance associated with it. Again, this really comes down to an aesthetic issue uh, of how you want your paver field to look in the in, the, in your property. OK, enough about design considerations. Let's talk about construction considerations uh, when installing permeable pavement. OK, quick recap. Uh, follow that schedule. Keep sediment out. Follow those notes and details. Make sure your contractor installs them during good weather conditions. Make sure your contractor scarifies that subsoil um, to increase infiltration capabilities. Uh, most importantly, in permeable pavement, you have a lot of stone that is not visible that lies beneath the surface. Um, that you will recall the picture I showed you of the clean stone versus the not so clean stone. Um, if you use stone that has a lot of debris and fine material in it, there is no way to remove it unless you completely take your system out. So make sure that the right stone is used and the clean stone is used. Um, and of course, if there's any revisions to the plan that affect the overall operation and maintenance, make sure that maintenance plan is uh, addressed accordingly and revised and provide as-built drawings as well. Um, there will be, of course, milestone inspections involved with this practice as there are with all that will be presented to you during your pre-construction meeting. OK, um, the subgrade itself, again, things that we've talked about already, but are particularly important for permeable pavement. Um, do not work the subgrade if it's raining or if it's wet. It should be a fairly dry material that can be easily scarified and broken up um, before the stone layers are placed. Um, if, for example, or if unintentionally sediments are introduced into a prepared bed, prepared excavation, those sediments should be removed um, as best they can before the stone layers are um, built into the field of the pavers. All right, so there wasn't much to think about there, uh, so let's bump right into the maintenance phase of permeable pavement as a whole. Uh, again, you're going to need maintenance uh, and that first year maintenance. Th th this may be the one practice where the first year maintenance might not be as costly as future year maintenance. <laughs> and the reason is um, if you've designed your practice properly, um, you would not expect a lot of sediments to get into it uh, long term. Uh, so that first year, your, your pathways uh, between your pavers or amongst your permeable concrete uh, may not have clogged at all. There may not be any sediment in them, and therefore the maintenance of vacuuming uh, may not be needed. Uh, but certainly that will happen down the road, uh, and then you will need to perform vacuuming of the system. There are uh, standard sheets available in the manual uh, to serve as a checklist for you. Um, but things you'll want to do on a regular basis uh, when uh, or throughout the different seasons of the year. Uh, quite often there are landscaping operations that occur or landscaping activities that occur uh, in and around your permeable paver field. Uh, it's advisable um, to have a leaf blower on hand as and to use it as frequently as possible to blow any debris that's conveyed onto the paver field or the concrete field. Uh, ideally, your landscaping contractor, if you so choose to use one, would do this every time that they uh, perform any type of activities on your property, um, but it doesn't hurt to have that for yourself, especially during the fall leaf season, um, because your contractors aren't out there every single day uh, cleaning leaves up. Leaves falling on permeable pavement materials and then run over by cars is a problem because uh, it grinds up the leaves and that makes the debris smaller. So the more frequent you can blow clean those pavers, the, the less uh, expensive maintenance you're going to have. 
uh, during the snow seasons uh, or season, I should say. <clears throat> um, we've all seen the ugly pile of leftover snow on a lot. There's a lot of debris in those. You should not place those snow piles on top of your pavers. You're asking for trouble. You should not place those snow piles where they will drain into your pavers as well. Uh, understandably, this may not be easy to do, um, and if it is unavoidable, you just got to do your due diligence to clean those up as frequently as needed. Do not apply sealants to permeable pavement systems. Um, more of an issue on permeable concrete, permeable asphalt, um, you will completely block and clog the pathways uh, that are necessary for the water to infiltrate into them. Vacuuming, uh, we briefly mentioned earlier, um, it's a must. Uh, minimum, twice a year. Ideally, you might need to do it four times a year. It's really dependent upon what kind of debris is able to be conveyed to your field of infiltrating uh, pavement. Uh, if you contract it out, uh, re a regenerative air sweeper is the best product or best equipment. Uh, to do large areas of permeable pavement. Um, it's cheaper for you if you have a place for them to dispose of the debris. Obviously, that's not a common for you to have that disposal area. Uh, so you will have to uh, likely pay for the sweeping and for the debris disposal. Most contractors will um, give that to you as a full price. Um, or uh, like our friend John Nigzelic, I don't know if John's on the call here today. Um, uh, John likes to do things old school. Uh, he gets volunteers with screwdrivers and shop vacs uh, to clean out the permeable pavers in the uh, St. Casimir Church project that we have funded as well. And uh, they're doing a phase two uh, this year, putting more pavers in. Keep up the good work, John, if you hear, if you hear me. <laughs> First year maintenance, uh, things to consider that you'll need to be aware of. <clears throat> uh, remove accumulated sediments and debris as from any kind of pretreatment that you have. Uh, there's not a lot of pretreatment options for permeable pavement, um, but um, if you do have the curb reveal on along the edge of per, uh, along the edge of uh, vegetated areas, uh, that's something to make sure that you remove that debris if it becomes a problem. Um, <clears throat> vacuum the system at least twice a year. Uh, ideally, uh, early spring and late fall would be the times to do that, um, given the amount of debris that is inherent of those seasons. Um, may need to do it more often. Uh, remove landscaping debris as soon as it gets on there and as frequently as possible. Uh, make sure your landscape contractors do that for you when they perform actions. And again, advisable that you have a leaf blower on site at all times uh, to do that kind of work on your own. Doesn't take much effort to do that, uh, but certainly something that's necessary. I should mention as well that obviously anytime you vacuum the system or you use a strong leaf blower, you have the potential with pavers to uh, remove some of the stone that's in the gaps between the pavers. Uh, and that's a structural issue. Uh, you'll need to replenish that stone on an occasional basis as well to keep that flush with the top of the paver surface. Okay, <clears throat> um, that was a shorter section on permeable pavement. Uh, do we have any questions in the chat regarding that? Nope. No questions, all right. Uh, if anything comes to mind, certainly shoot them to us uh, in the chat and we'll just continue on with underground infiltration and detention systems. Uh, we do have one or two of those planned for this year, uh, so let's touch on those. Uh, so these uh, are neat systems. Um, they can save a lot of valuable land, uh, real estate, <laughs> really. Um, we can accomplish infiltration um, just like we can with bioretention, but you know now you can park on it or you can use it uh, for the, the top layers for something other than uh, a nice landscape bed. Um, <clears throat> we've seen some of these with active recreation areas on them. We've seen some with parking lots on them. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can do on top of these. Uh, but generally uh, what they do is they stormwater runoff is conveyed to them and they allow water to infiltrate into the subgrade soils that lie beneath. 
Um, a lot of times the water is conveyed from rooftops um, frequently and or um, sometimes traditional paved areas, uh, asphalt and concrete are conveyed to these systems as well. All right, um, design considerations for the underground systems. Uh, not a lot to consider here, um, but some recap information, use those standards. Make sure accessibility is provided. Uh, this is important using manholes where needed so that these can be accessed by maintenance personnel and maintenance equipment um, as applicable. Uh, make sure that a logical construction schedule is followed. Do things that ease the future inspection and maintenance of the practice itself. Provide those notes and details, provide flood routing for emergency situations. <clears throat> and uh, material specifications are another important thing here. Clean stone is critical on the uh, these systems as well. And uh, some design assumptions that we have made uh, with the future with the slides that will follow this. Uh, we assume that you know what how heavy your traffic is going to be and the, you've provided a design that will support that traffic load. We assume that you've addressed foundation issues uh, of neighboring uh, foundations that make sure you're not going to flood basements, uh, either yours or your neighbors. And uh, that any high groundwater issues have been properly addressed and that the uh, flat subgrade uh, has been provided as well to maximize the potential uh, for infiltration of these practices. Need a little drink here, just a second. All right, <clears throat> so there are some pretreatment options available for these systems. Um, <clears throat> on the left hand side there, uh, the yellow doghouse looking things, this is a common a product that's used in our area, and there are multiple versions of it by different provided by different companies. Uh, but the one thing I wanted to point out is um, that that one particular doghouse um, feature, you can see it has a geotextile fabric that lies underneath it that you don't see under any of the others. Uh, that product is called an isolator cell. Uh, any water that gets into the system that's the uh, section of the system that it enters first, and that filter fabric allows for a lot of those sediments to settle out. This is like a, a first flush diverter from a um, cistern set up on steroids. <laughs> Think of it that way. Uh, your dirtiest water enters first, and it's trapped in an isolated area before it gets conveyed to the rest of the infiltration field itself. Uh, there are more robust proprietary systems um, that are available to you as well that um, you can see. Uh, there's one product called Bay Filter uh, that's on the right hand side there. And, uh, you know, those those act as uh, basically siphons or, or not siphons, but um, uh, sieves, if you will, that filter out some of the smaller particles before that's conveyed into the infiltration bed itself. So there are options, uh, but the goal for an infiltrating underground system is to have a pretreatment system that removes at least 80% of the total suspended solids that are in and expected to be in the stormwater runoff. So your uh, your drainage area to your system will, should dictate the type of pretreatment that you need. Whoop, I did something. Ah, I knew I'd. Sorry, Victor. Slideshow from current. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, got off track there. The next thing for design is to make sure that you have access, obviously, to the features of the product that you're installing. Um, these are underground. You can't see these things uh, unless you provide access to them. And you can see, again, on the left hand side, uh, there's uh, an that stand, that vertical section that feeds into the doghouse feature. Uh, that can that's an inlet that allows water to get into the system, but it can also serve as an observation point as well. Um, so it's important to have that ability to do that. Uh, often that's accomplished by manholes as well. And again, if you need to get equipment and people down into those systems for for observation and maintenance purposes, 
you got to make sure that those pipes are big enough for people to access them, of course, uh, which is kind of what is shown in the picture on the right there. Photo's a little grainy, but uh, that's another pretreatment system uh, that's more robust. Uh, but you can see um, that uh, it's certainly large enough. With, there's a ladder in it, so you can imagine there's going to be manholes um, that are uh, going to be on top of this to allow access to it. OK, and that's about the best we can do as far as uh, design features um, that you should consider um, when putting one of these systems in. Uh, now, as far as construction of implementing these systems, uh, Make sure your contractor follows that schedule. We don't want sediment getting into the system at all. Uh, those notes and details are critical as far as um, how to construct it. Again, scarifying the bottom layers, or I should say the top layers of the excavation uh, should be done during dry weather. <clears throat> uh, the materials should be clean, and then any revisions to the plans that are identified in the as-built drawings uh, should be reflected as applicable in the operation and maintenance plan. And again, uh, during the pre-construction meeting, we will provide you a list of milestone inspections we would like to be called to the site to visit, to, to visually see as the practice is being constructed. But a few things to keep in mind for your contractor and, and you to, to remember. Um, I've kind of said it again, make sure the soil is dry uh, when these things are being implemented as much as possible. Uh, remove any sediments that have inadvertently been conveyed to the excavated area, um, either before the stone goes in or if the, if the practice is in mid construction, you want to get those out of there at that time as well. Again, these are going to be buried potentially under traditional asphalt. So once they're in, they're in. There's no ac accessing the stone base without destroying your parking lot. Um, <clears throat> there are certain situations where uh, the system has to be put in place, but that's the only area for construction equipment to work. Uh, in this particular photo, uh, you may be familiar with the uh, project called Intro across the street from Westside Market. It's one we funded a couple years ago. Uh, they have a large underground infiltration system and some very sandy soils in there, um, but they needed, once they constructed it, they needed that area to do staging for, con for the rest of the construction of the project. Uh, so they put a layer of geotextile over top of the top of the system and then backfilled that with sand uh, with the intent uh, that when they were done using that as a construction staging area, all of that would be removed and the uh, very little, if any, sediment or sand would be conveyed uh, to the system itself, thereby inhibiting its ability to perform functionally properly. So there are things that can be done if necessary, uh, but again, it's critical that those things are spelled out clearly in your construction sequence. All right, as far as maintaining uh, these systems, things to keep in mind. The um, again, um, they will need maintenance um, and the cost will be variable throughout the different years it's in place. This may be another one where the need for maintenance the first year will likely be less than future years. Uh, it really depends on what's allowed to be conveyed to it that first year. Um, but you wouldn't expect a terrible amount of sediment uh, to get into this the first year um, if the area draining to it is stabilized. There will be uh, standard inspection sheets, uh, but things that need to be considered for maintenance, uh, these are typically not something you can maintain easily on your own. Uh, they generally need specialized equipment to do proper maintenance, um, specialized um, hosing, uh, specialized nozzles that um, draw the accumulated sediments uh, to a vac truck, for example. Um, you know, you as a owner of this practice are not purchasing these items. <laughs> they are cost prohibitive and it would not make sense to do so. But certainly you will may need to hire somebody to do this work on an occasional basis. <clears throat> uh, there could be confined space entry issues uh, for you to deal with as well uh, that you need people with the proper training to do that. Um, but that debris also needs to be disposed of 
Uh, and typically, uh, if you don't have a location to do so on site, um, that would be hauled away and part of your expense of maintenance. The first year maintenance uh, expectations, uh, you're going to have some sediments uh, in the pre treatment practice, <clears throat> whether that be a filtering practice or whether that be the isolator row setup. Um, uh, expect some might not be a sufficient amount to demand the need to clean it, uh, but you want to keep your eye on that. Um, <clears throat> you there could be the potential of any like trash and debris uh, being conveyed to your system. Uh, certainly want to remove that as often as needed. And uh, assuming you put some observation wells or some type of observation port into your design, uh, it would be wise to monitor the water levels um, before, after, and during rain events. Okay. <clears throat> So that kind of concludes the specifics for the practices we plan to, or that we will be funding uh, the 2023 grant cycle. Um, Jessica, are there any questions specific to underground detention? There wasn't questions, but there was a question about vacuuming um, general cost and then the maintenance cost. Um, Derek was able to answer that in the chat. And then Wanda Best said about the underground is that's what we're using our site for right now is staging ground. Okay, uh, before the practice goes in, is that? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, there's, uh, if we're understanding the question properly, from Wanda, you said? Mm -hmm. um, you said yes. Okay, yeah, so certainly um, using the the footprint uh, where the infiltration system is going um, as a staging area before it is installed is generally not going to be a problem unless you've fully excavated it first and then used it as the ex uh, as a staging area. Um, these are generally deep enough uh, where running equipment over top of it before it's excavated will probably have minimal impact on the compaction of the soils that are two to three feet deeper. Um, but if you're if you're using it as a staging area um, after it's excavated, but before the system is put in place, uh, you will likely be compacting those soils and that should you should take necessary actions to kind of break that up properly before uh, the practice is installed. So. <clears throat> hey, Chris and Jessica. Yeah, real quick. I think I only really partially answered Brenna's question there. I don't know if you have any costs on vacuum cleaning services in our area. I didn't have that on hand, unfortunately. Yeah, um, I don't have good information on that. That is something that we are working on, though, and we will have in the in the coming weeks. Um, your best bet estimates is to uh, talk to uh, street sweeping companies that are out there um, and uh, let them know what your situation is, uh, what your footprint is of what you would need vacuumed. Um, you know, there's enough of these systems out there now. They probably have a, if they've done some, they, they have a good feel for what it costs and whether or not uh, the vacuuming system is, is removing a lot of the stone in a paver system. Um, um, so there, um, there could be the cost of replenishing that stone, which would not be huge. Uh, the vacuuming process itself would be the bulk of the cost. Uh, so my recommendation is to call some sweeping companies. You can just kind of Google that and find some local ones. Um, and if you're, if you do get some prices and you want to share it with the group someday, uh, we'd love to have that information as well. Uh, but we're going to be doing our own research on that as well in the coming weeks. But there's. Did share some prices. Oh, okay. All right. The chat and also Brenda uh, wanted to know we are just in the design only phase, and I don't think we even consider underground retentions. Are we able to consider this if the person we work with in the design planning thinks it is a good option for us? Uh, yes. Um, what what's the name again? Brenda, is it? Or Brenna? Brenna. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Brenda. To answer your question, uh, if you're in the design only phase um you know we awarded you a grant um uh, and you had some assumptions on what you would hope you would want to install uh if you find that um 
if you weren't considering an underground infiltration system and you want to now, that that might be a better practice for your use of your land or your property. Um, we're certainly open to considering that, no doubt. Uh, it's, you know, we're looking to get water to soak into the ground. Um, so any opportunity to do that uh, is something that we would consider. Now, um, if you're completely deviating from uh, a concept plan that you provided us, um, whereas that you're, we don't longer want to do this practice, we want to do a completely different practice, you bring that to our attention first because um, we funded projects based on concepts that were presented to us. So hope that answers your question. <clears throat> That's good for now. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's talk about uh, the annual inspection process. Now, we understand that this won't come into play for several months from now. Um, and we touched on it earlier a little bit. But the, the we just wanted to emphasize to you that once you have a completed project, um, you will be required to perform at least an annual inspection on it. Uh, to report back to us what condition it is in. <clears throat> uh, and that um, is something that we look at when we perform uh, annual inspections as well. We wait for your report to come to us, and that's due by June 1st every year. Um, and then we look at what you see and we compare it to what we see and make sure we're all on the same page. Um, that's generally how it works. Uh, if, there, if we see things you don't or if something has happened, since you performed your inspection, we will certainly touch base with you and work with you uh, to make sure that we're all in agreement on what the remedies are to any potential problems. Uh, but annual inspections, um, again, uh, the, the deadline to provide that to us is June 1st of every year. Uh, and that's assuming that your practice has been in place uh, for, um, you know, a good amount of time. And I know that's a vague reference. <laughs> Uh, if you completed your project, uh, say you complete it in 2023, um, we would like to see that first report June 1st, 2024. OK, um, if you had a delay and you finished your project uh, in, say, March 2024, um, we would not expect you to submit an annual report to us for a couple months down the road after that. Uh, but we'll communicate with you. Uh, we know where your project stands at all times. Uh, we're working with you hand in hand here. So, um, um, but every year it's in place after completion. June 1st is the magic date. Um, it's advisable. Uh, not a lot of people like this, but you know these are stormwater management practices. It's always best to inspect them while it's raining. Um, every practice is perfect on a sunny day may not be the case on a rainy day. And that's the only way you'll know if they're working is if you're seeing it while it's during a rain event. Uh, be smart. Obviously, don't go out during thunderstorms. Uh, but there are many, many times it rains in Northeast Ohio. Um, but based on Jessica and I, my experience, it usually rains after 5 p.m., between 5 p.m. and 8 a.m. on weekends as well. <laughs> so, um, I know rain is random. Uh, do the best you can. <laughs> All right. Um, we've talked about the forms uh, that are available in this manual. S certainly use those. Um, or perhaps your design engineer created a customized form for you to use uh, that is part of your operation and maintenance plan. Um, that's the form. And the only thing I wanted to do real quick is to kind of just point out the most common maintenance issues we see with the various practices. Permeable pavement, the two biggest issues we see are the, the sediments clogging the pathways and uh, shifting of the pavers themselves um, because of a bad base material. Those are the two key things that you should be looking for. For bioretention, uh, the the by far number one issue with bioretention is the vegetation that's um, part of that bioretention cell. I'm not trying to call out the folks that were part of the Arch Park bioretention cell. They have worked as hard as anybody I've ever seen to try to maintain this practice, but this is what they're dealing with. Uh, you can see what the practice looked like the day after it was planted. Look, and if he had seen it, I couldn't pinpoint a picture of it, what it looked like a month after that. 
but it looked absolutely gorgeous. Lots of plants, a lot of different species, and then the weeds kicked in. <laughs> and so it became a maintenance nightmare for them. Uh, and you can see what it looked like just a few years later because they could not keep up with the weeds. They could not tell easily what was a weed and what was not. And so it really became a headache for them uh, and remains a headache today. Um, and we're still working with them. The bioretention cell still functions just fine, but the aesthetic aspect of it certainly is different. Uh, cistern maintenance, again, the biggest issues we know of are um, just growth of algae in the tanks uh, if you're not using a, a opaque tank. Um, <clears throat> and then the winterization and the plumbing associated with them as well, making sure that you have that flow bypass capability so you don't have water sitting in your plumbing or your tanks during the freezing temperatures. Underground systems, uh, again, um, I'm, I'm pointing out the isolator row idea. Um, the maintenance that's typically needed on an underground system is just cleaning out that isolator row as needed. Uh, and you can see uh, what it looks like when it's first installed. And these are just images I captured off of the website um, that one of the firms that produces this product. Uh, you can see what an isolator row looks like when it's got a lot of sediment in it. And then, of course, you know, the the jet nozzle that's used to blow that material out. You know, it blows it to a vertical vacuum system um, that sucks all that debris out and then you end up with a clean product, relatively clean product again. <clears throat> so that's generally the maintenance that's needed. Oh, OK, so I didn't have a lot there. Um, <clears throat> again, we didn't talk about green roofs, um, but I'm done. <laughs> uh, Jessica is going to wrap this up uh, and finish us out with some information about educational signage and uh, some closing slides as well. Thanks, Chris. Okay, it's almost 1130, so we should be able to get you guys out of here by noon for lunch. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, the signage. So right now, um, for the educational signage, um, these are required signages um, for your project after completion of your project. Um, and as you can see here in this slide, these are some of the uh, signages that we see. Again, like Chris said, we're not calling out some of these uh, projects, but um as you can see some of the some of the signages are small this is this is the one you don't the fleet parking lot is very small but it is a customized signage and that's what we're looking for um and i will give you minimum dimensions in a second this one here cofax green links is right next to the practice it's a one post signage and I'll get into that a little bit more and they're using our template um, for the display too as well. Um, with the signage, there are minimum um, dimensions for the signages um, and we will be emailing you the link to this presentation and we'll email you um, the signage package that will have all the information that I'm about to present in the package of what um, it's a signage guideline. Um, so with these signages, you can have um, the minimal suggested specs is 40 inches above the ground. Um, this doesn't include the specs that are, you know, you have to put it in the ground too as well. And then the panel um, minimum dimensions is 28 by 40. Um, we also highly encourage you each project to um, customize your signage. Um, we do have templates if needed, and you'll see them throughout um, these next couple of slides. Most of the signages are either single post, double post. Um, we see wall mounted signages. We also see the single and double posts that are metal versus wooden. Um, and again, we just highly uh, recommend that you customize your signage. 
Here are a few things about the uh, signage. One, um, it's a permanent educational signage, which is a must and a requirement, and it must be approved by the district as you are designing it. Um, so please do not finalize your design or put it in or install it before it's approved by the district. It's just send an email to me um, and Chris Hartman, and then we'll take a look at it. The GI team will take a look at it and then approve it, and then you can go ahead and start with the fabrication of it. Um, so here, the district's, uh, the sewer district's responsibility um, will provide a minimum criteria regarding the signage. You saw um, the dimensions. We will provide you with the packet, like I said before. Um, another thing that the district will provide is our current branding logo. Um, this must be on any of the public signages or advertisements you put out for outreach efforts related to your GI project. Um, also, the district has the right to photograph um, any of the projects um, that has been selected for funding and then we can use it for our public outreach and education pro projects as well. Um, the water applicant responsibility is design life expectancy of the project. Um, the signage must um, be in good condition as you are maintaining your practice. You also got to maintain your signage. Um, you got to make sure there's no dents. Um, it hasn't been knocked over. Um, just make sure you um, include that when you are um, inspecting your practice, inspect your signage as well. Um, another thing is uh, the initial cost of the permanent signage is eligible for expenses. Um, we are providing, you can add that to your budget for to install one permanent signage. Um, some Practices do have multiple signages, but the district will um, fund will um, fund um, one signage per practice. Um, and then the installation of the signage must be um, installed within 30, 30 days of the completed of the project. Um, and then once construction constructed, the grantee shall coordinate with the projects educational uh, signage contact and placement with the district. Again, um, please send us any draft signage um, before you install it so we can approve it. So here's some of the, um, the signages we do not wanna see. Um, this one is too small. Again, we're not calling out any other the projects, but we're just saying these are small. We love the customization of the signage. It's just very small for the educational purpose. You can see it's right next to the sidewalk. So when someone is walking, they can see the signage, but they probably have to look a little bit closer to read the information on that. But we do like the placement where it is on um, the practice. This one here, as I was talking about maintaining the signage, you can see I called out in the red circle, there is a dent in that signage. Now, um, this can this needs to be taken care of. Um, is it um, super, super important? No, but it we you can take care of that little dent there. Um, so these are the things where you wanna call out in your inspection um, report or something, signage is dented. Um, need a fix or something like that, or the signage has been, you know, broken off or something like that. So again, call that out in your inspection when you do your annual inspection soon. So now we're going to go ahead and get into some of the examples of the signage. This one here is one of uh, the sewer district templates. Um, as you can see, our logo has been updated. So this one is um, a couple years old, so we're going to update this. If you do want the template that we provide, um, we can provide it for you. But again, we really highly recommend you customize your um, signage as you'll see in a little bit. 
Um, this one is uh, intro. Chris mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, this is their signage. Um, we really like their signage. In the left bottom corner, you can see the district updated branding logo with other the other partnership logos there. And as you can see, it talks um, in detail about the practice and what's going on on their site. This one here is uh, customized to, this is a customized signage. This is a couple years old. Um, again, we really like this one because of the bilingual language that they use. They use English and Spanish language too here. Um, for the purpose, this is by a restaurant, a Hispanic restaurant, so that was kind of cool. The only thing with this sign, it's just a little bit small, but we do love where it's located right next to the practice and the customization of the sign. This one is uh, truly my favorite, asked Chris Hartman. I always mention this with all the workshops that we present. Um, only because how great the customization is. They have a site plan view here, and then they call out the permable pavers practices, not what's going on the surface, but also what's going on a cross section of what's going on underground. So um, um, keep in mind, any of these are on the story map, which is on our webpage, and you'll get a link to that. You can go and visit it if you want just to look at the signage. Um, this one is used in a double po metal post. Um, and again, it's right next to the parking lot. And outside this picture on the right, there is a sidewalk here because this is on the west side off of Lorraine Avenue. Um, and it's very um, user friendly and people can really see it while walking um, across this. Uh, this one here is uh, unique because it's in the wetland. I'm showing this one because they had to utilize, uh, I believe there was there are three signages out here. Um, one was mounted to um, the bridge that is by the wetland that you can oversee and, and um, read at the same time. And then um, the one, the picture on the bottom right, does call out in detail what's going on with the practice, where does the water go, and things like that. Um, the third sign does call out the species and a couple other things too. So each sign calls out a little bit, uh, calls out the practice, but a little bit different things, what's going on in the wetland. Okay, so this is an example of a single post um, signage. It's right next to the practice. I am keep reiterating right next to the practice because we like to see the signage, if possible, next to the practice. But um, it's tall, um, it does fit the dimensions, and it's using our template. You can clearly see it on the presentation, and this is right next to the sidewalk. Um, so anyone walking past this, they can see what's going on too as well. This one here is again, another single post. Um, they, I call this out because they use the wooden post here. They don't have any panel around the um, signage. Um, the signage is just mounted right on um, the post. And again, I believe this is another one of our templates as well, as well. calling out our permable pavers, I think in the bio. Okay, so this is a, um, look at a double posted sign. Um, this is one of our newest templates here because you can tell they're using our new branding here. Um, and again, this is just mounting on the, I think this is just one whole post here. And then they just put the the um, the sign in the middle. So um, that's unique way. And then this one here, and all these are, are past funded projects too as well. Um, this one here, they have it where they have a bridge overlooking the practice, and then they have two different signs, which is both are double posted, calling out the practice too, and what's going on here. This one is the, this one is in Ohio City, the living wall. Um, as you can see, um, I called out the sign. This sign is mounted to the wall, um, and it's in bright orange colors. You'll see a closer look in a little bit on the other slides. 
And then this one's another wall mount. Um, this is in an entryway before you get to the practice or it depends on how you're walking. Um, and it it's very detailed. It calls out the practice, not just what's going on in the surface, but like again, the cross section of what's going on underground too as well. Uh, this is the wetland one. Um, I'm calling this out because it's a mounted one, but it's mounted to this bridge structure here that's overlooking the wetland. Um, you can overlook the wetland and then get educated at the same time. Again, um, so this here is about the location of the signage. Here on the left, you can tell this is a gated parking lot. I believe you need um, like a key card access or something, um, but they put it as close to the practice as they could. Um, when people are coming in and out, they can see it. And again, there's it's next to the sidewalk with people walking. Uh, the one on the right is intro. Um, Chris showed this earlier when it was in the construction stage, and this is where it's completed here. Um, the signage is right on the practice um, and it's in the parking lot. And this is um, on West 25th of the rain and people walk here all the time. So it's very visible. Okay, so that's all about the signage. Is there any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Martha had a question. Let me find it. Mm -hmm. um, if we have two practices, are two signs eligible for reimbursement? No. If you have two practices on one application, it's only one signage. So they would put both practices would be referenced on the single sign. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that you as a grantee can get another signage, you can, but it's not gonna be reimbursable. Just one signage. Anything else? Uh, everything else we've been answered. Awesome. Okay, so with that said, it, um, so we're just gonna, this is a conclusion. Um, so again, maintenance considerations, the design phase, the construction phase, and the long-term, keep those in mind. Um, this is being recorded, so if you need to um, review back to those sections, please feel free. I'll again send out the link next week. And then here's some additional resources um, for cisterns and underground infrastructure detention video. Um, I don't think you can click on a link, but again, we'll send those links out to you as well. Um, so there is some stormwater free credits. Um, I don't know if Chris wants to talk about it. Okay, yeah, kind of forgot we had this in here as well. <laughs> Got ahead of myself. So yeah, the uh, you you're likely familiar with our stormwater fee. Um, and there are stormwater fee credits that can be uh, achieved to reduce that fee. And the practices we fund with our GI grant program uh, are eligible practices that can result in that. Uh, so we wanna make it as easy as possible for all green infrastructure grant recipients that install projects to get this credit. Uh, you'd be surprised, we, this is not an automated process. Uh, we don't automatically give you the credit um, and there are a number of, of funded projects out there that have not taken advantage of this um, but uh, we recognize um, that we should make this as easy as possible uh, so uh, the bottom line is uh, to uh, apply for a stormwater credit uh, with us uh, there's a cover sheet that we refer to as appendix a which just tells us the who what when where and why kind of information about the, the credit you're seeking. Um, we generally have all the information we need uh, at that point to give you, to award you the credit, okay? Uh, typically folks would have to provide us all kinds of design information uh, to verify what, their, what they accomplish as far as the function of their practice, because that's what dictates the credit percentage that you earn. 
So uh, we recognize that we have that information already because we've gone through a design and a review process with you and we've seen the project constructed. Uh, so we know more about your project than most people, uh, than, than most projects we, we don't work with that closely. Uh, so again, uh, when it comes time to, uh, to get a credit, that would start when you have completed your project uh, and then we will remind you, uh, submit your Appendix A document, which is just one page, and uh, we will get that in place. Um, <clears throat> the um, Again, the grant program itself we've talked about requires you to perform an annual inspection. Uh, so does the credit. The credit requires anybody who has a credit to do the same, um, unless you're a residential credit, but we're not talking about those kind of projects. Um, so, you already have to do uh, everything you need to do for our grant that you would need to do for our credit. So we're not asking you to do any more work than what you're already doing to maintain that credit year after year after year, um, which again, the credit is, has to be renewed annually. So we will align those dates for you uh, in our system. <clears throat> Just like that bullet says. <laughs> okay, uh, so that's it. Uh, as far as our presentation, um, did any last questions come in in the chat? Jessica? Uh, no. Okay. Just some statements. Okay. So no more questions came in. Um, this is just a reminder that uh, every year we have our Clean Water Festival, uh, typically held in September. Uh, we did update this QR code, I assume. Jessica, right? Oh, we haven't. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, you may get referred back to our old uh, last year's uh, Clean Water Festival, uh, but certainly uh, uh, look for it coming up this year as well uh, in September. And last slide here, uh, key contacts for the Green Infrastructure, Green Infrastructure Grants Program. Um, uh, I will personally say, call Jessica first, all right? And she, if she cannot answer the question or if it's something specific that one of us um, work on as far as the technical side of things, uh, she will happily pass you along to us to get your questions answered. Um, but yeah, Jessica is your primary contact. Uh, she let me talk at this point, so I'm gonna say Jessica is your primary contact. So, and uh, uh, one person we wanna mention here as well is uh, Derek Vogel. Derek's on the call today. Uh, but Derek is our primary inspector uh, of active projects. Um, you've heard me talk about the milestone inspections that we uh, conduct, and we provide you that list of inspections during the uh, pre-construction meetings. Uh, Derek is the go-to person that will be on site uh, to perform those inspections. Uh, certainly, if he is not available, uh, one of us uh, will re uh, do that for you as well. Uh, but um, uh, you'll get to know Derek uh, during the construction phase. Okay, I think that's a wrap. Um, so again, thank you very much for your time. I hope uh, you enjoyed your morning with us. We certainly enjoyed presenting to you. Uh, at any time, give us a call if we have not answered any of your questions or if something comes up in the meantime. Uh, so until then, we will await your designs to come in if they have not already, and uh, be happy to work with you through in the design and the construction phases for the remainder of 2023. And um, we'll let you have the rest of your day back and go Guardians, right? I hope somebody's going to the game. <laughs> have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.